Backstage Pass with Meredith Marks recently caught up with Ken Stacy, who once toured with greats like Elton John, Michael Jackson, and Ambrosia. And now he's a little more behind the scenes, producing and being an incredible music director and vocal coach to the stars like Kenny Loggins and Richard Marks. It's a pleasure to sit down with Ken Stacy and catch up. So here we go. Oh, Ken Stacy with us right now. Such an incredible career. And I wanted to talk to you because I find you very interesting. You have had the opportunity to tour with some of the biggest names in the world, some of the biggest tours of the world. You've been front man, backup singer. You were able to be a judge on American Idol. You are an incredible uh, musical genius. I believe <laughs> Elton John was like, you freaking kicked ass doing all of these great musical ensembles. And on top of that, you do vocal coaching. So let's dive into it. How are you? I'm <laughs> great. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you for having, having me on your show. I'm so excited. I'm so happy that you're here. Yay. So I want to ask you, how did it all start for you? When were you able to, to get into music and, and how did that first happen for you? Well, you know, I, I remember singing as a little boy. I mean, I just, I remember listening to the radio and gosh, my mom had one of these old egg shaped eight track players, you know, with the big cassettes. Yeah. I used to put in the four seasons and all this different stuff and, and Neil Sedaka, <laughs> that's the stuff that was around the house. Oh. And I, and I was all, I'm a, you know, pretty, or most of my life, a very kind of lyric tenor very high voice registered voice so that was all that that was in my wheelhouse so i would sing to that i just felt drawn to it to want to sing to it um it wasn't until college i had a buddy of mine a uh, very dear friend of mine a guy named ron cohen who was a fabulous guitar player was going to cal state northridge we were buddies hanging out i was going to cal state northridge we were just hanging out all the time um he knew i sang he would hear me sing, you know, just for fun. And uh, he had a dear friend, David Vanacore, and um, they had a, a wedding band way back in the day. It was in the 80s. And but this wedding band was no regular wedding band. This was comprised of just musicians that would go on to kind of rule the world. And um, so they would invite me out to sing like uh, I just, you know, like um, uh I just want to stop, tell you what I feel about you, babe. Uh, what else? Uh, uh, um, Billy Joel, uh, just different different songs, right? Yeah. And um, so I guess they were kind of checking me out. I didn't know. So they asked me to be in an original band. Ron and David were forming an original band. And uh, I said, sure. Okay, why not? And so we got together and we started writing songs and putting things together. And, and after a few months, we did a gig at a, a club out in the San Fernando Valley called the FM Station. And the mm -hmm. place was packed. They you know, had all their friends and family and musical cohorts. And I did, you know, had all my, you know, my friends, family come out. And Meredith, it was like, I saw a video later. It was like somebody plugged me in for the first time. I, I, I was oh, like, wow. who in God's name is that? I'm like a whirling <laughs> dervish running around, grabbing the mic, singing solo. I like, come over. And it's like, who taught? I don't know where that came from. That's like, that's like something that was moving through me. You know, I was finally doing something that I guess I was meant to do. And it was like being a, a kid in a, in a sandbox. I was just, it was pure joy and fun and the audience reaction was great at that time i was getting ready to finish college and go to law school um, i had applied yeah. to a few different law schools got really good uh, exam numbers on my lsats and you know pretty decent grades so i was going to go to law school and 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 be an, an environmental attorney which means i would have been a a, a broke attorney <laughs> She's, but but anyway. Well, I guess that's you know kind of par with the music industry, right? right. right. <laughs> or so, radio. <laughs> there you right. Go. So so that began it, and and after that gig, I talked to my family. It's like, 
well, something happened and there's something here and my LSATs are good for a year. Mm -hmm. So I want to step back from this and I want to give, I want to see what this is about. Well, mm -hmm. it just kept going and going and going. So I just took on a variety of jobs through the years that supported me while I was in the band. You know, we were immediately uh, in the studio all the time, tracking, writing new songs. And we spent several years trying to get a record deal and we got very very close we had major major management we were showcasing for all the major labels you know all doing all the stuff that you did back then to get signed and playing around town and um we were that close and then guns and roses hit and we were the we were not guns and roses <laughs> and it was a seismic shift in the industry and that was it and so the band disbanded shortly after, and that's when I learned about session singing, and I began pursuing a session singing career. And that put me on the trajectory of not only doing session work for people like Diane Warren and countless other incredibly successful songwriters, but it also started prepping me for the idea of maybe singing for somebody else, right? Right. And so um, that's that began that journey forward. And that was kind of through the 90s. At that same time, I was supporting myself as I was building my session career. And I wanted it to be something that was as closely related to um, uh, being a, a full time singer as possible. And I met somebody that was the um, head of the vocal department at um, Musicians Institute. And mm -hmm. he invited me to be an instructor there. And that began my coaching career. Oh, so as I was yeah. building my singing career, mm -hmm. I was also a coach. So I was able to do both. And, 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 and my singing career fed my coaching because as my career grew, I had more to offer my client, my students at MI, not only from the pedagogy of what it means to, to have your voice function properly, et cetera, et cetera, but from a professional standpoint. So I was asked to create some uh, some classes there um, about being a professional session singer and things of that nature. Uh, I was I ran a couple of what they called live performance workshops where I helped the students improve their performance shops and everything. So they kind of went hand in hand. And then toward the it's pretty end rewarding, don't you think? Like being I was the teacher as well, but it's it's fun mm -hmm. to be able to to yeah. to coach young kids into doing what you're doing and it's did you find it rewarding it was it was very rewarding it was interesting um i think it was it was a combination of things there were there was a, a teacher's lounge and and i called that the the dream killer the dream the death the death lounge i never went in because the couple times i win went in there were a bunch of teachers and they're very talented people who had given up on the the drive towards creating their own careers and in, in the way I think they wanted to. Mm -hmm. So they resigned to the concept of just being teachers and they were not happy about it. So <laughs> every time I'd go in there, I'd go, no. And, and when I didn't have a, a student, I'd find an empty practice room and I'd keep practicing. So I never stopped or I'd write a new song. I just, it's like, no, that is not going to be me. <laughs> I don't know how long I'm going to be here, but I'm not giving into that energy. So I just kept working and working. And then toward the end of the nineties, um, I, uh, I left, I, I needed to leave it. I was like, okay, I got to move on. And shortly after I got my first tour and, and also my session career was taking off and I was able to start, uh, supporting myself solely as a session singer. And then I got the opportunity through a very dear friend of mine, Mark McMillan, who I was hanging out a lot with, uh, writing songs, amazing singer, songwriter, keyboardist. And he was the MD at that time and played until now for Bobby Caldwell. And so that was my first touring opportunity. They were looking for a, uh, a backing vocalist to go out on the road, go to Japan and do some, some uh, smooth jazz, jazz concerts here in, in California and all that. So I got the gig and I actually got the gig as a percussion player too, which was comical because I really wasn't a percussionist. And you had Bobby, you know, 
he always had the best musicians. So how I ended up, I guess vocally I could hold my own, but you know, but I knew like two or three little patterns that I could kind of, you know, send to right. a shaker. But you're, just going, was, you're just going with it. You're just going with it. <laughs> yeah, the question was, like, can you play a percussion? Sure. And all of a sudden I've got this massive array of percussion and I, you know, but Bobby, Bobby being my first touring experience was incredible because you can't find a more generous and sweet beautiful human being and the talent was mind-boggling and especially when we were doing the blue note series up in japan those were very you know they weren't giant stages and he would always bring a very big band so you're in this smoky you know lots of smoke the japanese love to smoke and you know you haze you couldn't see the audience the you know classic right the lights just blaring down i'm five feet from him singing and playing percussion and watching him and he's spitting out and singing but his <laughs> voice is so commanding and beautiful and wow. stunning and he everything i was just like okay that's how it's done oh my god so i worked with him for almost a year and a half and then i got um something what? circled oh go ahead was it was it elton that you got next it was elton right it was elton yeah i had prior to getting the bobby gig I got close to getting a, a gig with Elton and I was um, uh, suggested to the band and as a backing singer, but they also needed a percussionist. And I thought that my, I thought I, it looked like it was pretty much a done deal. And um, Davy Johnstone, his MD and guitarist seemed to really love my work. And, um, but they found John Mahon, beautiful singer, but also a hell of a percussionist and drummer. So they got two for the price of one. Yeah, because I can't, I can't imagine you're going from the blue note, smoky blue note in Japan, right? And the lights are, are beaming down on you. And you honestly, you could probably just pretend to do it. And like Madison Square Garden with Elton John is a, is a little different, right? So I guess yeah. maybe you were a little hesitant there. It happened quick. So, um, and I never, yeah, I did not tell them I could play percussion that that came with the Bobby thing. So it circled back, you know, uh, for about a year and a half, I was working with Davey doing a lot of session work. We became really good friends. And he said, if it ever comes back around again, would you be interested? And I said, well, yeah, that'd be great. So in two, in the beginning of 2000, I got a call and uh, the road to El Dorado was coming out, which is a, 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 a what do you call it? It's uh... was it an animated? Thank you. Animated, An animated, right. animated, animated <laughs> feature and very cutting edge for its time, Yeah, and, which was beautiful. And he and Tim Rice, Elton and Tim Rice did all the music for it. Yeah. So they were doing their promotional junket, uh, you know, which really, and also that year Elton was the um, um, Music Cares Artist of the Year. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was all that we did a bunch of stuff. We went, we performed on the Grammys for that. Performed with the Backstreet Boys. It was hysterical. We did uh, the Grammys with the Music Cares concert that he did. It was a private concert where I got to perform with, I mean, everybody and ev anybody. Bonnie Raitt, Phil Collins. Uh, the list goes on and on. It was astonishing. They all came up. We all performed Elton songs. It was amazing. Uh, we did, um, we did, uh, uh, um, uh, in New York, we did Broadway cares, you know, uh, it's not always easy to be thrust into going yeah. from something a little bit more low key to this wild craziness. Yeah. I mean, how did you adapt to that? It was a lot. It was a lot. And I had a lot of insecurity at that time, um, mm -hmm. as artists often do. And, um, and it was challenging, but it was also, you know, I, I did everything I could and I rose to the occasion, you know, um, but it was really great. And yeah, very quickly we were doing that. And then uh, as, uh, and then we did this whole big special for MTV, VH1, CBS, uh, the, it was huge. It was huge mm -hmm. at the Venetian room up in uh, San Francisco at the Fairmont hotel. And there's a whole story behind it where, where, uh, Anyways, it, it, it's too long a story. But uh, from there, uh, I was that culminated with Elton needing to fulfill one last record obligation with Universal, 
that became his one night only greatest hits from universe from uh, Madison Square Garden. So I mean, it was from you know Bobby. I mean, amazing and the Blue Note and some jazz to suddenly were you know doing the warm, which it worked out great because it gave me a chance to kind of get a feel working with Elton doing the you know because we also when we did the junket for the movie we were also doing his great you know some of his hits so it was getting me ready and then when that all stopped and we did his greatest hits record which was amazing then there was a pause and then they kind of called the band down because they had a huge band for all that and i was asked to stay on the band stay in because i could play acoustic guitar and um and you know i'm able to elton and i are both welsh and if you look at earlier pictures pictures of well of elton i think we kind of somewhere in there either because it's an ancient connection but we look a lot alike it's like oh my when i would come off stage people would say are you his like cousin or is what so we're both welsh and i think vocally there was a i i could emulate qualities and and really shadow him well and support him so I was asking. We need, uh, we, we need ancestry.com. Right. <laughs> right, right. I've always we need, wanted. We need a double spit test stat. Oh my God, when he was really young. Could you ima- Wait, could you imagine that? Could you imagine if you were actually, what a story. Oh yeah, no, I could because my life has been like this. I kid you not. When I was a wow. little boy growing up, uh, I used to, I used to pull my covers over my head at night and I would, I would escape life and i would just you know it would became my blank scape and my my projection so i'd open my eyes and i would imagine being on the on the stage with michael jackson and the jackson five well where did i end up being the jack you know with michael jackson yeah. when i my dad lived up in washington and when i was a kid i'd visit him and he had this amazing stereo system and all these records and I kept looking at Elton John and the Brown Dirt Cowboy, and I'm the, oh, just such the a good cover. album. Oh my god! And oh just my god, the record cover alone—it's like what yes. is all the? Oh my god! And I'd mm-hmm. listen to it again and again and again and again and again and again. Honestly, I will tell you, Meredith, I believe that. I believe that I was on a path. We're all on a path, and I was moving towards these things, and I just didn't know it. I just didn't know it. The same thing, you know, with working now with Kenny and all that. I can see where I was coming here. I just didn't know it at the time. Right. So, yeah, Elton, we then I was asked to be in the band and was in the band for a couple of years. And then um, and then I elected to leave, which I know a lot of people go, what? But um, I wasn't really happy. Not with Elton and the band. Amazing. The two and a half hours on stage and we did the face-to-face tour with Billy Joel and it was incredible and Billy's band it was an amazing experience and we got to tour all over and it was fantastic but the rest of the time for me was just sheer boredom and it was I didn't know how to live on the road and um, and the constant flying and traveling I wasn't ready for that and uh, I didn't have the stamina or the emotional maturity to know how to handle all that at that time let me just break in here for a second because sure people watching this they have this glamorized picture of touring this is what this is one of the things that i do is i i bring everybody to reality here i was actually on tour with hall and oats for two and a half weeks in 2002 living on the bus living in hotels and it's it's tough stuff so People that are watching this that think, wow, you know, living, living on tour, you know, on the road and being on tour. Can you give people kind of just a quick little glimpse as to the reality of the kind of the brutality of that, what the toll it takes? Because people don't understand it. Okay. So let me, I'll, I'll do this as concisely as I can. First of all, I don't care whether you're staying in a five-star hotel or a Hilton, or a, or a, not the Hilton, the the, uh, like one Holiday of the Inn. Holiday Inn Express. Thick. Okay? You're exhausted. Mm-hmm. You're exhausted. It's another bed. It's another room. P- people have been in there. A million of people have been in there before you. It's energy. It's smell. It's that now. Obviously, when you're staying at four or five stars, they're cleaner. They're better. They're they're quieter generally but not always. Mm -hmm. Um, But the bottom line is you never stop moving. You don't get a chance to really be anywhere 
you go from the venue back to the hotel, you sleep, you get up, you get on a plane, you go to, and we didn't bus it. We were planning it. It was exhausting. Oof, and you'd fly here to get to there. So it is, you're in different time zones constantly. You don't get enough sleep. Uh, one of the legs, I never, I was sick the entire leg. I could not get well. It was horrible. Mm -hmm. um, now that was with Elton. <laughs> Now get let, let me give you the example with with uh, Ambrosia, right? With Ambrosia, we're weekend warriors. We're staying at the Holiday Inn Expresses. Those were the good. Those were when you saw that, we were like, great. <laughs> or sometimes, <laughs> depending on the gig, when we did, you know, Ambrosia and Friends, we'd get you know really nice hotels. But a lot of times, there were times where like, what? You know, you'd be out in the middle of nowhere. There were no nice hotels. To, you're mm -hmm. playing small, cool, vibey places, but yep. there's no place to stay. And you're like, oh, God, you can't run the heater because all you smell, I don't want to gross people, but you smell human skin and hair. You know, that's all in the room. It's disgusting. <laughs> you're suffocating. You know, it's hor it, It's exhausting. It's just freaking exhausting. But so, then you have the flip side. You have the flip side of when you were with Michael and doing kind of like a um, uh, one venue for a while, wasn't it the O2 Arena? Yeah, but we never, while? but we never got to do it <laughs> because okay. Michael died eight day, eight days before we were leaving. Michael passed away, so that but but that was a different thing. So now let's talk about what it takes to prepare, right? Yes. It was six days a week, 16 hours a day for months. For Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Getting ready for a yeah. tour that the movie only gives you the tiniest little glimpse into. It really does not. I mean, it, it's all it. They did a great job calling together what, you know, to give you an idea. But the productions, every song was going to be a multimedia event. Costume change, everything. We it we were there all day. We were singing, perf recording. The background singers were constantly going in. You know, uh, Michael was so generous. We he could have left all his pre-recorded vocals from other things, but he loved our sound. We said, you know, we had Dorian, Holly, and Daryl Finnessy who had toured with him for years. You know, and Judith Hill, who they discovered, who's obviously gone on to do amazing, um, and myself and. Um, you know, we had a great blend. It was a great background section. And Michael loved the sound. So they, when we weren't rehearsing, we'd be in a little back area somewhere in the, you know, uh, it, first it was at the Forum, then at the Staples Center where we're working on pre-records. Uh, we would be working on choreography for our background stuff. We'd be doing all kinds of, it was constantly working, constantly working. Did you have uh, Orianthe on that tour? Yeah, yeah, Ori was there, yeah. That was her big Love break to make her. it in the States. Yeah, yeah, she's Amazing. great. So, um, yeah, it was a great band and um, really incredible. So, but that was, you know, 16 hours a day. It's a lot. That's a oh, lot. You come home exhausted, go right to bed, wake up first in the morning, jump in the shower, get in the car, drive back out to Inglewood and rehearse all day and never stop. And all the rehearsals took place in California. Yeah, it was the form. And then we moved to the Staples Center because the Staples Center was large enough that we could start, they could start putting together the staging and propping and everything to start testing the things that they were going to be doing. The gotcha. massive, you know, high def screen that every, everything you'd be putting on, you could watch the whole concert through 3D glasses because it all be coming on the screen and coming at you. And it was, this we're, was. We're talking about the, this is, this is it, this tour. Is it tour. People might not know. This was the final tour for Michael Jackson and Ken. Well, was I, yeah, I mean, it was it was going to go on. It was going to be a movable feast. You know, it was going to be yeah. when he the day he died, there were 50 sold out shows over the course of two months at the O2 Arena. And they just added 15 more shows. Wow. To that and then. It's a lot of shows, Ken. And then it would have moved to another continent mm. in one spot. Mm. And it would have been there for a couple of months. Then it would have moved to another continent. And there, for, you, you, you see, yeah. yeah. And well, because so, it's such a production, it takes so long to set up. You can't, you can't just move it. You couldn't move it. So we had apartments set up in London. 
I had a self-produced record that was getting a bunch of airplay in Europe. I had all these plans to do like grab my guitar, take the channel, go over, do interviews, you know, do some acoustic concerts. You know, when he died, so many plans and trajectories and hopes and dreams went with him. Not everybody's in the band. The dancers, oh God, they were. All right. It was it was soul crushing. So you know, but but life goes on, and 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 Dorian bless his heart, you know he he and Daryl asked me to be brought me in and recommended me and brought me into that, and then when that all left and and Dorian went back to um, um, American Idol. American Idol was moving on. Uh, you know, the band was moving on to The Tonight Show, so he recommended me. And that's how I got on to Idol, and I was there for two seasons, and that was really an incredible experience. Now, you were a first-line judge, so walk me through this process. I want to go and um, I want to go sing my heart out, and I want to be America's next Idol. <laughs> so I go in there and I say, hi, I'm Meredith, and I have a song to sing for you. What's the process that I would have to go through? And when would I have met you? So I'm a first line judge. So I'm at one of those big arenas and there's 10,000 kids there. And they have a whole row, double sided, of booths set up with a with a vocal coach or something like, so there were a few vocal, a Deborah Bird, myself, were the main coaches on, on, on the show at that time. You had uh, 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 executive producers, assistant producers, line producers. So they would partner us up. And so, you know, they, they'd come at you in lines of fours and you'd be there all day long. It was mm -hmm. exhausting. And all you heard was, you know, it was the cacophony of the crowd, people singing this, that, and they'd come up to you and they'd, you'd give them about 30 seconds. And then you'd decide whether they were going to move, get a, the opportunity to then go forward uh, mm -hmm. for the producers or thank you, come back next time. So was so that, that hard for you, Ken? Was that, was that, or, or, or were you completely fine doing that to people? Were you like, I don't know your full personality, but um, I think it's, a little, it's a little tough sometimes to give that news. Yeah, you know, I'm a firm believer in truth. And if somebody has talent, I want to reward that and I want to give them opportunity. And if somebody is fooling themselves, then they need to go figure something else out. And the yeah. sad thing about it was the level of entitlement that so many people felt literally coming up, knowing they couldn't sing, saying, but, you know, you could make it sound good, right? I mean, that's the mindset. I was like, that was a, that was not my generation. <laughs> This was the digital oh. generation and the generation of autotune and all this stuff, you know, saying, okay, you know, that's, that's normal now. And it's like, uh, no, no, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> but, but then you would have, you would have, you'd be looking for, for your people that were legitimate, like, wow, that's great. And then you were looking for people that would make good television. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's yes. Yes, because you see some of these really bad people get through, right? So you have to pick those those people. But, they, but they've got great personalities, and they may mm -hmm. not be, but they'd make. So look, I, I'd always tell the kids on the show, look, here's the truth about this. This show's not about you. And yeah, you've got a handful of people that have gone on to have careers, and, and that's great. And, you know, 19 productions, that's their way of producing and putting out records, and that's all great. And you have a few people that have, been incredibly successful but i said for you, the way you got to approach this is this this is like working at disneyland you're a cast member and when this season is over they're going to recast the show depending on a myriad of things that what's going on in music at that time what what they're what they're going to test market all kinds of things this is a television okay. show that's built on repetitiveness Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, they're not going to, what worked last season may have to completely change next season, right? Depending on a variety of factors. So if you can realize that you're a cast member and get over yourself and recognize that you didn't earn the thing that you're being, that's being thrown at you right now and stay <laughs> humble and learn and keep your ears and eyes open and make relationships, you may just come out of this with the, with the foundation of support that you'll need to create a career. Yeah, right? that was always because one of the, my jobs was I had a lot of jobs. I was a vocal coach. 
I was a first line judge. I was a vocal producer. I was a vocal arranger. Those mashups that they did on on the uh, the vote off night, you know, I did those. I they I was tasked with creating the vocal arrangements, on and rehearsing the kids. So I would go to the uh, I would go to the mansion, and I'd show them all their parts, and you know, and 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 then we'd rehearse it on stage, and I'd work with the core choreographer with uh, there was a guy I think it was Napoleon amazing I, he was the, he was my favorite um, um, choreographer because he knew not to overwhelm the kids and I did choreography because there were times he couldn't be there he'd work with like tours and they would bring in choreographers that oh this is my chance Fosse Fosse blah, blah. and it's like dudes you gotta understand these kids have to sing they can't do all this yeah. so I'd have to get up there and say no Oh, but, but do the I I fell into doing so many different things and then I would be I the Wojohn brothers were producing all the commercials that they would do with Ford and all that stuff so mm -hmm. I would and I knew the Wojohns I had done a lot of session work for them through the years as a singer myself so I would go and work with them and collaborate with them on coaching the kids when they would do the commercials and sing in the commercials so I I wore like eight different hats on that thing. Mm -hmm. And it was a great experience. I learned a lot and I learned a lot of, uh, about that aspect of, of the business that has certainly became, a, 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 its presence is still today with others, you know, um, the voice and idol and all that stuff. So it is a way to go. It's it, it but again, um, if you're gonna do that, um, it's it's a different beast. And when I, when I have on occasion prepared my uh, clients, those kind of clients t tend to be, they want to be a star more than anything else. Mm -hmm. I tend to not work with people like that. I tend to gravitate toward and seem to get clients that are about the work and the craft. And if stardom, whatever success comes from that, it's it comes from, that's ancillary, mm -hmm. that, that I tend to work with people that are really about being great artists. You know, so um, and I'm and I'm grateful for that. I, you know, there are star makers out there and, and that are in pop and that whole thing. And that's great. That's not really my bag. Um, I want to do a quick touch on because um, I want to talk about a couple of other things before we go. Yeah, I want to do a quick touch on uh, I, I got to meet you and say hello in person. I believe it was February yeah. of 2018 in Atlantic City. Yeah, Ambrosia and Friends it was Ambrosia right. Orleans, yes. Stephen Bishop and Bill Champlin. Um, great, amazing show. Yes. And I've told you before, but I'll tell you again that you blew me away when you were um, fronting Ambrosia because it just sounded so good, Ken. It really, really did. And so how, how, how did you like fronting Ambrosia being the front man as opposed to yeah. being behind? Well, that's a great question. It was it was a very different experience. I had fronted bands uh, countless times through the years. And when I was playing around town earlier on in my career, I'd put bands together and I'd play clubs around because, you know, that was the way back then. Well, it still is. But, you know, you kept your chops up, you made connections, you made relationships. And and so, you know, I'd done that. It wasn't unfamiliar to me. And I so I knew how to run a band. Um, but obviously you're stepping into a band of original members who have who are highly successful it's a five-time grammy winning band and you're stepping into somebody else's shoes you know david pack's shoes and yeah. you know there were other people th before me that had filled those shoes because david left the band a while before right. um it was it was challenging it was rewarding challenging that you know i always said pound for pound it was the hardest gig i ever did um, mm -hmm. because to sing in that range, David, I mean, those vocals and David and I've never met, you know, and, and if we ever do, I will shake his hand fervently and, and say to him, thank you for, you know, participating in the band with the other guys and creating such account iconic and beautiful songs, not just the ones that everybody heard, you know, the, the more, uh, pop oriented ones but also the the prog stuff just holy crap you know when i started learning i was like what you know oh god oh, you know? so it was a lot there were some there were yeah. certain songs where you i couldn't even count the meat i just had to remember how it felt and where i would come in and come you just had to feel it 
And um, so it, from a musician standpoint, it taught me a great deal. I was working with phenomenal musicians. You know, the, everybody in the band, um, just incredibly seasoned musicians, phenomenally talented. So, you know, that was school for me as everything else was in my, my life. You know, it's school. You're learning. You're learning. Because I, I love that. To- I love that you're ste- like it's a stepping stone, but it's such a learning experience. I love that. Well, I think everything is. I yep. think everything in, in our lives and careers are. And mm-hmm. everything that, that preceded that prepared me for fronting a band. And, you know, I mean, I had certain natural chops for getting in front of, 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 a, uh, of an audience. But that grew. That, Im- that Im- I, improved is a word, you know, but that would also say that what I was doing was lack. I don't think it was lack. It grew. It expanded. There we go. What I was able to offer an audience expanded. And in the last few years of being in the band, I came into a new place of awareness where now it was more about I, my, which I teach, you know, in my teaching, my performances became purpose driven. And it was no longer about, you know, gosh, I hope people tell me how great I was. Um, and trust me, I'm still, you know, we all have insecurities. It's always great to hear it. And and when things don't quite go the way you wished, you can really get down. But, but with the band, I'd been doing it for so long that it was like, okay, I need to shift what this what this is about for me. And I really started approaching it from a from a purpose-driven place where I really consciously made a decision to take the stage as a channel. And how could I move energy out on the audience? and and be a conduit right so Mm -hmm. it's not about me anymore it's not about me it's about something else something bigger than me and so like at the end of the shows typically we'd always do biggest part of me you know and when i would when we'd get to the venue at soundcheck i'd always found find my pathway down into the audience and i had my handheld mic systems and my in-ears so i could go anywhere i wanted so I I would watch the audience and I'd always look for the people, you know, you'd always see the really pretty people or the ones with the, the ones that you knew they were they were already getting all the attention in life. I would always look for the people that you could tell just felt like they weren't being seen. Right. Aww. And those like I'd get into the I'd start walking and I know. OK. And then all of a sudden, bam. And they'd be like, oh, my God, <laughs> I'd extend the hand. You know, have a you know. Typically, I'd ask a woman to stand up, and we'd I'd sing to her, and some of the Aww. guys I'd walk over and clap. You know, come on, buddy, and here we go. And the you know the ones that were you could tell were a little reticent, a little shy, and you just want to love on them. You're just like, come on, you're we're all here. Nobody, this is all we're all into this together, and it was so rewarding for me to have that feel, feeling. You know, the feeling that you were helping people to get beyond their own insecurities because I know what that's like. I've had to contend with that as a performer all my life, you know, and um, and it's very challenging. It's very hard to step in front of an audience when there's voices in your head that want to constantly tell you you're not good enough or this, that, or whatever, or in other channels of your life. So, you know, I felt like it was a way for me to heal more through it and to help other people heal in their insecurity and feel a part of something bigger than them um, and bigger than all of us. So that's that. Okay. the last couple of years felt really great in that extent. Um, and then when when we got to uh, the early 19, uh, 2019, we did a cruise um, and then we did one show in Arizona and then everything went to shit with the pandemic. I got... Oh, I, I got COVID, um, everything shut down. And I had been wanting to start going a new direction in my career mm-hmm. I'd been with them for a while. And it was great, it was beautiful, but it would had run itself out for me. And that was the perfect time. I was doing all this stuff around the house. I was like, I refinished our garage door. I was, I got us refinanced. I was in my wife said, yeah. all I've ever known when my wife and I got together uh, you know, uh, she says, all I've ever known is you in the band Ambrosia and gone every weekend. And then when you're home teaching about your life is just go, 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 go. I've never seen you relax. And she says, 
please don't go back out on the road. <laughs> and I said, babe, thank you. That's all I needed to hear from my well, partner. Happy, happy wife, happy life. Yeah. Okay. And, okay. and I knew it wasn't going to leave them in a lurch because they had no shows. Right. And so I, that was it. I made an announcement. I reached out to the band and I know they were a little surprised, but I wanted to control my exit. I felt like this was my decision. I felt like I did it honestly and gracefully and respectfully. And, um, and, and so, you know, I still stay in touch with Mary and Burley and I, I love Mary and Burley. Love them. And, you know, when they're out, I've, I'm always, you know, uh, my buddy Kip Lennon has been, uh, he stepped, he covered for me on a few occasions through the past. So he was the perfect guy to reach out to. You know, he and his, and his brother and his cousins have the van Venice and they're just mind boggling. And they've mm. been around forever and they're massive in Europe and everywhere they play here, you know, they sell out. They're incredible. And Kip is incredible and he's an amazing performer. And he was a perfect fit to step in. So I'm like, everybody, you got to go see Ambrosia with Kip. You got to go. You know, I'm still a big fan. Um, Absolutely. But, make, but making room for that during the pandemic allowed a new process to go come through and I'm, I've been doing a lot more producing and vocal arranging and my coaching thing has gone to another level. You know, I've been coaching uh, Kenny Loggins since November of 2020. I coach uh, Richard Marks. Um, you know, I've, pre I've prepared other people to go out on major tours with bands like Journey and stuff like that. So, you know, Jason Derlaka, who, who I coached quite a bit to get him ready. He's been now with, uh, with Journey now for a, a couple of years. He's an, uh, 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 another keyboard in the band, extra keyboard and incredible singer and sings leads and backgrounds. So I prepped him for that. Um, and uh, producing artists and, and, and now starting to go out and start sing live, singing live myself again. Um, and it's made room. My son is now almost 19. He's at a really important time in his life you know, college and now more than ever, I feel like I need to be present in his life. Yeah, now yeah. That he's a young man and in his education. And um, I've, I've had a lot of touring in my life. Ambrosia, Elton, all the time I spent with Michael, all the time on Idol and all those things. And I felt like, you know what? Um, it's time to make myself open to wherever this is all going. And now this I want to tie this whole beautiful life of Ken. <laughs> so I want to end the interview talking about this Christmas because, ah. okay, this Christmas, you ended up doing a Donny Hathaway song and rearranging it. And I have to tell you, I, I've told you before, I'm going to tell you again, the musical arrangement on this is perfection i mean from the second note yeah, all the way through Thank the you. entire thing is just it's it's like it's like um god can i be crass it's like a musical orgasm <laughs> i love it okay it's so beautiful um so i heard I'll have what she's having <laughs> um I, when I, when I do my show, my radio show, I always play in December. I always play holiday music. Yeah. And so in November, you, you put this on Facebook and I go, well, what's this? And so I clicked it and I'm listening and I go, Ooh, yeah. And it's almost like everybody loves a super group, right? And you got these, yeah. you got these, these great artists to come on board. Michael McDonald, Kenny Loggins, Richard Marks, Melissa Manchester, Frida Payne, I mean, you had so many different people and it benefited the Donny Hathaway Legacy Project. Yeah. Really quickly, how did you make the decision to even do this and to um, come up with this vocal or this musical arrangement? Because it's brilliant. Well, thank you, first of all, Meredith. That sure. means the world to me. Thank you. Of course. So I had been working for several years with a group of musicians called The Tribe. And The Tribe is composed of a whole variety of different musicians you know, ranging, you know, in all kinds of backgrounds uh, that contribute and with um, with the Together Foundation. And um, they go out and they do concerts to raise money and awareness uh, for people at risk 
um, and they've done they've done these kind of projects in the past. So I was asked to um, participate in this. I had brought the Donny Hathaway This Christmas song to the band in prior um, um, Christmas concerts when I would perform it. And then this concept came up, excuse me, and I was asked would I be interested in, um, in producing it. And uh, I said, sure. And I knew when I said yes, I, I I didn't want I didn't know what it was going to turn out like, but I didn't want to do the the same thing that kind of everybody does. Every year you get uh, you know dozens of artists doing this Christmas, but they typically do it pretty much like Donnie. And listen, in my opinion, and they all sound great. Don't get me wrong; some beautiful artists have done it. Uh, Layla just did it this year, which I thought she God, it was unbelievable her version. It was with it was like with her dad. It, you know, posthumously, and it was beautiful. I thought that was great. I thought that was innovative. She, the way she did it was great. Most of the time, it's done so much like Donnie, and it's like, okay, I get that. It's hard to want to do anything else. But on the other hand, if you look at Donnie's career, how many times did he cover other artists' songs and completely put his own twist on it? Mm. And I felt like that's that, to me, is the spirit of Donnie. And Donnie, pound for pound, is like my favorite singer, songwriter, artist of all time. And I have a few that I really that have really informed me as a singer. He's the number one guy. Oh. Every time I listen to him, every time, it's like I'm going back to school on learning how to sing. Every single freaking time. So, and his soul and heart and his in his arrangements and everything. So I'm like, I think Donnie would be okay with me taking a stab at this. I don't know if you'll like the result, but I don't think he'd have a problem with me trying something different. No, it's and perfect. thank you. And so I really thought, you know, let's let's go to a modern kind of, you know, this whole thing where, you know, you 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 broaden a vocal arrangement. You add it's like musically it's there, right? Although I did get inspired to write one more section, I kind of took the chords and I changed the voicings a little bit to create this transitional section into the last chorus uh, after the solo because I needed more space for more of our artists to sing. I was like, what am I gonna do? I don't wanna add another verse, blah, blah, blah. What am I gonna do? And then that was the inspiration. Just was that after Melissa Manchester? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Woo, woo. Well, that is Melissa. So that yeah. is Melissa. That is Melissa's section. Yes. I came up with some chord, and that was a beautiful blessing because it opened up because the chords changed. Yeah. I was able to work with Melissa to create this block of vocals with her singing all over it that huh. really created a new a new feeling for a moment going back into that this Christmas thing that opens it and then launching into the last chorus. And it just takes it to a final higher level. Yeah. And, um, but it gave me, a, a, I felt a creative license to just kind of arrange vocally. And I love arranging vocals. And, um, and, and I've had some wonderful experience doing it through the years, did it for Elton, a very famous producer, arranger, Humberto Catica. I worked with him for many years as a sing not only as a singer, but he'd bring me in to help arrange vocals and put backing sections together. And he allowed me to do it on a Celine Dion track that he was producing and some other amazing songs. And and I sat back and watched him. <laughs> I mean, you're talking, look up his resume. You're like, are you kidding? You know, he and David Foster were, you know, creative partners for decades and wow the hits and the artists are Michael Bublé and Celine Dion and da, 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 da. It's insane. So that again was school. I got to watch the best of the best, um, pick through and, and realize that's great. That's fluff. That doesn't work. And da, da. So I think, you know, all that came together and I drew on all that to try to come up with something I, I felt, I hoped would honor Donnie and honor the song, but, but take a fresh approach to it and create a platform now uh, which I hope will, our, my hope is that we're going to reach out to a whole new slew of incredible, amazing artists that we all know and love and bring them in so that each Christmas, I hope that we have a new, fresh version. Not rearrange it, because I don't want to do that. I love the arrangement. 
but bring- or or do a different song and let's get a whole album together and we could potentially Please. do that too that's somebody else has talked to me about that so that's that's something we can do as well and i would love yeah. to do that but with this tune i i would love to breathe new life into it because each christmas then there would be excitement about ooh, who's going to sing on it this year bring attention to the donny hathaway yes legacy project raise more money because it's all about raising uh awareness and programs for people that are suffering and dealing with me- mental health issues because that's what took donny away schizophrenia took him away from us my god 33 think of the Think of what he did and what he would, what he's left us and what he would have continued mm. to do, mm. you know, and then also to be there for his beautiful daughters. And yeah, I mean, it's just, it's yeah. heartbreaking to imagine him not being here. So, um, and Thank more you. than ever, we need to support, you know, after post pandemic and state of the world, we just need, we need as much support and helping each other as we can. So that's how that all came about. And I'm so glad because everybody chipped in and we had amazing singers come out and it was I think just it was a great it was an incredible response and i'm so glad that you did that it was seriously a wonderful holiday gift for everybody thank because you. i think so many people enjoyed it ken stacy thank thanks you. so much for sitting with thank me thank you meredith i loved it thank you I'm oh so you're such an interesting wonderful talented person and a great mm-hmm. human too mm-hmm. don't go anywhere thank you <laughs>